So I want to welcome all of you to Silver Lining for Learning and our episode on South Korea and Singapore on remote teaching and home learning. I'm, I'm one of the five co-founders of this initiative, Chris Didi from Harvard. I'm joined by two of the others as co-hosts for tonight, Kurt Bank from Indiana University, Punya Mishra from Arizona State. Uh, behind the scenes, we have Yang Zhao from Kansas and Scott McLeod from Colorado. And our purpose is to have a, an interesting conversation. The goal of silver lining for learning uh, in the midst of this terrible human tragedy is to highlight the opportunities that it does present for advancing education through innovative use of learning technologies and to celebrate the people who often bottom up are inventing uh, new ways of helping their students uh, in the midst of a very unexpected and forced transition. So uh, we will start with uh, both Nina from South Korea and Chi Kit from Singapore, uh, briefly introducing themselves and saying some of the things that they're interested in talking about with us. And after that, we will throw it open to questions from us, questions from our YouTube audience that are uh, uploaded to us here on Zoom and see where it goes. So uh, Nina, would you like to begin? Good morning from Korea. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so my name is Nina Lim. I'm both a curriculum designer and first grade teacher at Stratford uh, in Silicon Valley. And I also do research with Dr. Paul Kim at Stanford Graduate School of Education. So today, what I wanted to share with everyone was how distance learning experience was for me. And then I'm going to compare what distance learning looked like in the US and in, in South Korea. And then lastly, I'll share my insight on what educational technology can look like in the future. So I was part of the design. Um, we might want to do the introductions first before, okay. um, right? Before we jump in with the actual presentation, because we have one more guest there. Okay, so uh, greetings everyone. Uh, this is a G kid from Singapore. It is uh, 5.30 a.m. here. So normally <laughs> I'm in bed in, at this time. <laughs> but I'm here because I cherish the opportunity to join this conversation. I'm a professor of education in the National Institute of Education in Singapore. So we, we call it NIE and the co-director of Cradle Research Center in uh, Nanyang Technological University. So my institute, NIE, is the teacher training institute in Singapore. And uh, every teacher is taught a course on uh, what we call technologies for meaningful learning. So they're taught how to use uh, technology for pedagogical purposes in the classroom. So for myself, I also taught learning sciences courses in our graduate programs. And 15 years ago, I set up the learning sciences lab in Singapore to do uh, design-based research in schools here. So Nina, you wear quite a variety of hats. You're, you're a teacher, you're a researcher, you're involved in policy. So tell us about um, how you're combining these. So um, I've been working as a teacher for the past about six years. Most of the times I was working at a private school, but I also worked in public school for a little bit. And then I got to know Dr. Paul Kim. So I got into research about doing different educational programs online, like Smile, Halo, Thousand One Stories. And also had the opportunity to work with the Ministry of Education to kind of share my insight on what distance learning looked like, because I've been teaching my students in Silicon Valley, California for about 10, week, 10 weeks from South Korea, all the way from South Korea. So that's been an interesting experience for me. So should I go and share? Yes, please go ahead. So to go back to what I was saying, so 
every week the curriculum design team would make um, create content online and we would train the teachers and then the students will get a daily lesson plan that looks something like this on the right we don't see your screen actually can you try to share it again i, oh. I see it oh i don't see it. yeah yeah it's working uh, okay then ignore me <laughs> Yeah, and so, I'm trying to check the YouTube. Yep, it's working on YouTube as well. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so as you can see, every day a student would receive a daily lesson plan like this with all the links. And every day we met four times a day in the morning at 10 o'clock at 1230 and in the afternoon around two. So we had different lessons for every live Zoom ses sessions. And after every session, we would say, this is some independent work you have to do until the next meeting. So we're kind of working throughout the day. And then there are many different platforms we use for communication and feedback. We use online portfolio called Seesaw, where students can submit pictures, they can draw, they can record themselves, they, they can take a video of themselves to submit their work. And we also have one-to-one -one learning conference, which is really nice time to kind of settle down with one student at a time to kind of ask them how they're doing academically, how they're doing socially, uh, emotionally. And we also have weekly update for the parents. So every week we had a summary of how each student did and we sent it to the parents to communicate with them. We also used personalized instructions like I read in Epic. So on these websites, we could assign specific math or reading lessons uh, that based on students level and interest. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, I've been implementing a lot of inquiry based programs like SMILE, which was developed by Stanford. So this program is where students get to make any question they want and they share with the class and the students comment and rate each other's questions. So it's a program to kind of let them know what high quality questions look like. And my afterthoughts, after teaching for about 10 weeks on online and also by interviewing some teachers, is that the similarity between United States and South Korea assistance learning was that a lot of teachers had difficulty uh, keeping track of student accountability. It was really hard for them to like keep track of who's coming to class and if they're not coming to class or not completing work, there was not really a way to kind of encourage them to and keeping up uh, their motivation. So they're coming to like their Zoom sessions every day was really hard for them too. And the biggest difference was that Korea is going more towards blended learning. So starting in about early May, they started to have students come to school at least once or twice a week. Whereas in the United States, we were doing full online learning the whole time. And I noticed that the difference between US and South Korea was less than the gap between public and private schools. So it looked like a lot of private schools had more independence on like when they can start their online learning, what they will teach online. Whereas a lot of public schools kind of had to wait until the, until the government informs them like when they can start, what kind of things they're gonna teach. And also the infrastructure was a little different. It looked like a lot more private schools had all the devices ready, not only at school, but also at home. And the parent support at home was a lot um, more at private schools compared to public schools. And another really important thing I learned that is that my, my friends were first grade friends. And I learned that even like really little ones, like six years old and seven years old, they can use educational technology as long as we train them. So by the end of 10 weeks, they were able to join Zoom meetings on their own. They could submit their work online by themselves. They could send me emails. So they were very used to it by the end of the distance learning experience. And another thing was that it's really important to use technology throughout the semester. So my class has been using a lot of online programs and websites. So when we transitioned into online learning, the transition was really smooth for them because they were already using all those programs uh, while they were at school. And then lastly, um, as I mentioned earlier, we were doing a lot of personalized instruction, which is something we've been talking about in education field for years. Like there's a big need for us to personalize their uh, learning 
But one really good way to do that is by incorporating artificial intelligence in like by testing the students and the AI can automatically kind of assign what kind of lessons the students need to um, further like develop their skills or help them in the areas they are having difficulty in. So moving forward, what I think would work best for a lot of education um, areas is that we can do a lot of blended learning where it's not 100% face-to-face learning, but it's a face-to-face -face learning and also online learning combined. So one other way to do this is something called flipped classroom. So instead of like traditionally the student coming to lectures and then doing some kind of homework activity, what we can do is we can create online content that they're going to watch online first. So when they come to class, they can do more classroom activities where they talk to each other, we can, they can work on team projects together and things like that. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and what, a, what an interesting time. I, I want to talk about this more later, but I think many people would say first graders can't do this, right? That, that okay. They can't use the technology. They can't use these sophisticated ways of learning. Um, and, and, and now they're gonna be terribly behind because they couldn't learn anything. Well, if they're terribly behind, it's because we as educators fail to take advantage of the kinds of things that you're describing. But right. I wanna to bridge to Chi Kit because I know that in Singapore, you've been looking a lot at home learning. And in fact, Nina, you were talking about a model in which it wasn't that the teacher was there all the time, that there were intermittent interactions with students. And in the meantime, they were learning at home. So Chiket, how does this similar or different to what's happening in Singapore? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me share some of the practices of uh, home-based learning in Singapore. So like many other countries, Singapore was in the soft lockdown stage. Uh, from early March onwards. So we, we call it a circuit breaker. And schools were closed from uh, April, April the 8th. So uh, schools were closed and students were doing online learning. Uh, so let me share what, what we do. So teachers use a range of methods to supervise their classes. So they, they take uh, attendance taking using a mobile app. They have selected live lessons using Zoom. And then they have online activities like quizzes, assignments, and more for the students. So uh, the school will send a weekly schedule to the parents. I think Lina talked a little bit about that. Uh, parents to help supervise their child. And the schedule typically involves time slots for the different subjects with breaks in between uh, for the student to do in the, at home. And uh, part of the home-based learning involves a couple of short Zoom sessions and online activities. So uh, what was in, of interest to me, there's also online physical education, PE lessons, and online music lessons. So it's not just one way. It's not just, uh, it's not just transmission. It's to, to, the, the kid has to do the physical education, has to do the music. And to show participation, the parent has to record the child doing the steps, the dance steps, or doing the physical education, or, or singing and upload. Uh, the, the media recording. So, uh, so that's, that's some of the things. And for those, uh, the kids are also having tuition for subjects like playing the piano, violin, and uh, language, the, 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 the Chinese language learning. And now they are doing online now. So we have online piano lesson, violin lesson. Uh, so as you imagine, uh, younger kids need more parental supervision than uh, older kids. Uh, but what, what we uh, find out is uh, a new generation of kids growing up to use technology for their education. So uh, I heard from my colleague that even toddlers like two years old have their playground group activities in Zoom. So a group of eight, eight kids with a teacher will have the activity uh, in Zoom. So uh, this onset of the COVID-19 threw many of the teachers, students, and parents into deep 
unknown territories. It was tough at the beginning, but now, now two months later, I think many feel that uh, this home-based learning is not bad after all. It's not so bad after all. It's like they have almost adapted to it and are not resistant to the idea of some form of home-based learning being part of the new normal. So that's, that's my first point, that the school lockdowns, have, the school closures have accelerated the pace in which students use technologies to help them learn and the pace in which teachers use technologies to learn. So uh, a little bit of resonance with what Nina mentioned, what Chris said, uh, young kids get to use technology and uh, they, 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 they are picking it up. So that's my first point. Uh, my second point is uh, in this home-based learning, uh, students have different degrees of readiness for home-based learning. So to do home-based learning, you need computers, internet connection, you need the space to do the online learning in the home. So uh, as you expect, the conditions in each student's home are different. So uh, we have different homes, uh, they have different resources, opportunities and support outside of home. Some, some may not have the devices or enough devices at home. Imagine a, a family of three kids, you know, they are doing home-based home learning, they need three devices and they need the connectivity at home. So, uh, so these differences and disparities of students become more obvious and uh, it kind of affects students outside school. Uh, but in Singapore, one of the principles of the education system is uh, every child should have equal opportunities. So this is where our Ministry of Education is doing a good job in, uh, in trying to provide for students who do not have these uh, devices, this connectivity. So in Singapore, we, the Ministry of Education oversees the public schools. And the majority of schools in Singapore are public schools. So the Ministry of Education try to close the gaps. Uh, so once the, gov the government announced the school closures, the school responded very fast. They found out, they found out rich students need the laptops and devices and the stable internet connections at home. So they, they, they uh, loaned the 20,000 laptops and devices to children, and they loan uh, 1,200 routers to children so that they have the devices and connectivity. So for students who, uh, there are so students who cannot do, who, who not have learned at home. So schools help classes for, so, so schools also rally together to remain open. Uh, children who rely on uh, subsidized school meal program and still come to school, so other, others who do not have the conducive environment for home learning can still go back to schools to study. So a small percentage of students still go to schools for their learning supervised by teachers who went back. So schools help classes for parents to come and pick up the devices, giving them tips on how to support the children at home. So, uh, so these are some of the ways the Ministry of Education try to help students who have difficulties with home-based learning. So, uh, Maybe let me stop here. I have more to share later on here. Yeah. Great. So, Punya, I know that you have a question that relates to questions we're also getting from participants on the YouTube channel. Um, thank you, Chris. And thank you, uh, both of you, again, for joining us today. So one of the questions, and I think there's a variant of that that's online uh, that people have asked as well, but I'm going to start with what I... How much of what was uh, happening that you saw with this home-based learning and with this blended or, you know, online... Uh, was sort of replication of school and what were some, were there any different or new practices that emerged? And sort of a follow-up to that would be, was the emphasis still on what we call standard school practices of, you know, uh, recall of information, uh, you know, the acquirement and recall of information or as opposed to sort of more higher order skills, which is like creativity and critical thinking, um, you know, how, how was any, were there any of those things sort of observed as well? So two part question, one is, was the goal here replication of school or were there some new plans, uh, things being tried out? And this other part of course being like, what was the emphasis on higher order thinking and you know, and so on. So anybody can jump in and uh, we can sort of continue from there. Um, for the first question about the replication of actual classrooms, I mean, it surely was very different, but it also goes back to the difference between private and public schools. So when I was talking to a lot of 
I teach at a private school and when I was talking to a lot of uh, public school teachers, it looked like they were meeting only like 30 minutes or one hour a day, which doesn't really replicate what classrooms would look like. Um, in comparison, a lot of private schools were doing more Zoom lessons uh, throughout the day. And one of the reasons um, uh, most of the private schools teachers mentioned was the tuition part. And because the parents are already paying tuition for the semester, we were kind of like pushed into a situation where we have to teach them all day. Whereas a lot of public schools were kind of waiting on what the government has to say. And if they say you're going to teach 30 minutes or one hour a day, so they're, they're following those um, instructions. And what was the second part of it? Again, the critical thinking part? Sorry, um, the I, I wasn't mute. <laughs> um, was it on sort of the, uh, was the emphasis on sort of more on sort of recall of information and, and, and so on, as opposed to more higher order thinking skills? Was there an emphasis on that? I think we, at the very beginning, it was more of a recall where we were making PowerPoints based on all the facts in our textbooks and the students kind of had to read those textbook pages and answer questions. But as we learn more technologies and different features and Zooms like breakout rooms, we're doing a lot more uh, group projects. And sometimes they're doing like long-term projects like animal research report where, mm -hmm. where we taught them how to do research online. And we went through the whole step of doing like the outline and the rough draft and the final draft. And there was also um, a project that they had to do on their own called Habitat Diorama. So we learned about different habitats around the world for different animals. And then the students had to choose a habitat and they had to make a replica of what the habitat would look like. And they had to take a video of themselves presenting it and upload it on CISO. So by the okay. end of our distance learning, we're moving more towards like critical thinking questions and group projects. Thank you. And then what about the, the, the situation or the context in Singapore? So uh, in Singapore, uh, we, had a, we have a learning management system called the student learning space so provided to all the schools. Uh, so the good thing is uh, this learning management system comes with a, a pedagogical framework. So it emphasizes learning experiences uh, that includes uh, the direct teaching, but also includes uh, activities like inquiry learning, discussion and collaboration. So teachers can design lesson, le uh, lesson plans that involve this uh, more open-ended, uh, authentic learning kind of activities. Uh, what, uh, what teachers also do is, uh, given this uh, framework, teachers also innovate on their own. So they use other tools to help students in their learning. So they use Shobi to mark assignments. You know, they use Class Dojo to, to communicate with parents. And so, uh, so there's a, uh, there's a, teachers are able to adapt and use different methods for their lessons. Uh, let me use this opportunity to mention uh, what, what I see as a silver lining for home-based learning. Uh, we talk about opportunities for learning, self-directed learning when it comes to home-based learning. So, uh, so what comes to mind is, uh, you know, for example, home-based learning, can it kind of inculcate some kind of resilience? So for that, I want to share the story from my colleague who shared that uh, she had a grade five uh, daughter and uh, she, her experience is uh, in home-based learning, you're doing things on your own, perhaps with your parents' supervision, and there's no teacher to give them the answer. So there's no teacher face-to-face -to, -face to tell you the answer. So you have to try to solve a problem and if the system prompts you is a wrong answer, she still has to continue and try on her own to solve the problem until she gets it right. Whereas in a classroom, you see the teacher there, you just ask and uh, because of the social kind of uh, dynamics, the teacher will more likely to answer you and give you the answer. So in a way, she said that during home-based learning, she, she learned how to try her, her own problem-solving learning understanding in a, in a more resilient way, even though she doesn't quite like it. And, uh, so, uh, so the home-based learning has different affordances for learning some of the soft skills, uh, for example, doing things and trying to do it in a more resilient way. So uh, when, the, when students do not have the resources, uh, they could not get the technology to work. Uh, they have to adapt to the different kinds of learning required from the different online activities. I think it's an opportunity for them to, 
to tap on the affordances to just to, to practice some some kind of resilience at this personal level. So uh, yeah, so there are opportunities for for some of these uh, ways where we, you can try to test students uh, through different kinds of learning methods. Great, right, Kurt. Do you have some thoughts you want to ask about? So people might need uh, um, some kind of understanding of the context in each country. Uh, we talk about, we have a Department of Ed in the United States. They have Ministries of Ed. So when, when Nina mentioned Ministry of Ed, you had been talking about California. There's no Ministry of Ed in California. You're working in Korea, right? Um, so, and what's, are you in Seoul? Yeah. Okay. So uh, people might might not have caught that when she went quickly between the two. I'll start with, with uh, Chi Kit. Um, my master's students go back to Singapore, and when I visit them, they tell me I've been secundered to NIE. So NIE is part of NTU, Nanyang Technological University, and NIE, National Institute of Ed, are across the street from each other on the same property. And they were separate, they become one, and they would tell me I've been secundered to NIE. And I'm, you know, oftentimes, my, my, my question and my point is that the government in Singapore, it's a smaller country, and so they can target specifically things that they want to work on, whether it was mobile learning 10 years ago, which you know they had a lot of grants for mobile learning or 10, 15 years ago. Gaming was one thing, uh, you know, kind of action research things. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? What the, the close connection between the universities and the schools, getting people to work with the universities, getting teachers to work with universities so that what happens in the schools is research-based. And the second part of that is, did the government act fast in creating new funds for teachers and schools and universities to address COVID? And so are you seeing a lot of people secunder today due to the COVID crisis or pandemic? Yeah, Kurt, you're right. So uh, uh, teachers, teachers are trained in NIE. So uh, that's, that's our, our, our place for training teachers. Uh, so we, we have a system where the, it's, a, it's a kind of top-down centralized system, a common curriculum, and the Ministry of Education uh, oversees the schools. And NIE as the kind of provider of teacher education so you use that advantage. We are a small system. We can have a, a tight nexus between uh, schools, uh, ministry education, and researchers at us at NIE, where we can work with schools to, to do some of these uh, innovative practices. So we do that a lot in the, these research projects on the Learning Sciences Lab. So uh, this will tap on a point that Chris would be interested in. You know, we, we, because of this, uh, this. Uh, top-down structures, we are able to do things with some uh, effectiveness efficiency. So it's well coordinated at the top level. So uh, teachers are trained to use ICT in a classroom. Uh, as I said just now, uh, there's an online portal nationwide put to good use and teachers are trained to use this uh, online portal. And when it comes to a COVID-19 crisis, uh, the ministry are able to provide guidelines on the online learning for all the schools at a suggested number of hours. And you can coordinate the online learning, uh, provide devices and uh, routers to students. And recently when, uh, when Zoom was used, there was a security feature that allows people to come in and uh, post uh, inappropriate image, uh, images. So it was, uh, it, uh, the ministry education was able to resolve this at the top down level and uh, uh, resort the Zoom security feature. And, and uh, we had uh, term time in March, April, June, March, April, and then June is supposed to be a school break uh, because it's centrally coordinated. MOE can uh, have the change of timetable. So we had, a, we had a term break earlier in May uh, and, and now June is supposed to be holidays. It's moved to term time when, when things have eased and students can get back to, can get back to uh, classes. So the strengths from doing things in a coordinated top-down way. So pro having provided structures on what teachers can use for home-based home learning, uh, there are also space for teachers who are ahead of the curve to innovate in terms of uh, the use of the, the design of the online activities. So uh, 
at that level, there's a lot of self-help groups, uh, communities among them to try to share the best practices. You know, I have a problem, I have a little problem with using this software, this app, what can I do? So, uh, so this is, uh, we had the top-down advantages and uh, we also provide some space for bottom-up innovation. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I have a follow-up for Nina um, that it, it, you were talking on the, on the side with all of us before we got started. And you said that parents in California seem very receptive to your ideas. Can you just talk about that a, a minute? Can you tell me what surprised you that they were receptive to doing? What project did you do that you were really, you know, kind of not sure you should ask and, and, and you went ahead and did and asked about the project and you did it. So what were you successful in doing that you weren't, you weren't sure about and what's next? What kinds of things haven't you asked them about? Haven't you talked to the parents about because you think that's really risky so uh, you've, you've, you've done some things that are so, somewhat risky compared to what teachers are doing in the rest of the US and the rest of Korea. Tell us about that. And what's not, what, what else haven't you tried yet? So I feel very fortunate to be working on Silicon Valley where there are a lot of educational technology companies like Google, Apple. So a lot of my students' parents were working on these uh, fields. So whenever I wanted to implement something new related to like critical thinking or using different types of technology like sensors and things like that, they're very receptive. So for example, in my classroom, I've been using Smile throughout the year. So this is an online program where students can ask any questions about the unit. And then we kind of go through the questions and rate the questions. And this is a great way to teach them how to ask good questions. So it's not teaching them facts, but it's teaching them the skill to think and ask questions about anything they see around the world. And the parents are very receptive of that because they, they appreciate the need to think critically more so than just memorizing facts. And moving forward, as I said earlier, we can do some kind of flipped learning where the teacher is not doing a top-down education where they teach everything, the students just are sitting and listening and doing their homework, but it's more like we're creating online content for them, for them to see at home and learn at home. And when we come, we can do a lot of more collaborative projects using different educational technologies, not just Smile, but just using many different websites to research what they know and ask questions, ask for the questions they have. So I've, I've always felt very lucky to be working on Silicon Valley. So I wanna bring up a theme that's emerging in our audience questions, but it's also a theme that's come up, I think every single episode that we've had so far. And that's the theme of assessment. So on the one hand, many countries have either relaxed or eliminated some of the high stakes summative assessments this spring that ordinarily would have been given. And <clears throat> if I can speak for the co-hosts of, of the Silver Lining for Learning Initiative, on balance, we think of that as a good thing because it opens up opportunities for creativity and for learning things that aren't on the assessments that we think are really important. But that doesn't mean that assessment isn't important. And that doesn't mean that we don't need to have some way of knowing whether we're succeeding in whatever we're doing, whether it's resilience, whether it's creativity, whether it's student communication. So I'd, I'd appreciate hearing from each of you, either as individuals or in terms of what you see happening in the countries, um, are there alternative kinds of assessments that are emerging? Or uh, from a top-down perspective, are, are you being told that you still have to prepare for the high stakes? Now, Nina, I know in a private school, it's a little different situation, but I know that you've talked to people who are in public schools in, in both countries. So it seemed like a lot of schools were not giving specific letter or number grade for this semester that we did distance learning, which was same for our private school. So we have moved on to pass and fail, but instead of, uh, but to keep the students accountable for completing their work, coming to classes, all that, we did give them a lot more comments, like written feedback 
uh, what they did really well on and, and what they can improve on. And as I said earlier, we had that one-to-one -one conference, which is a really nice to, time to kind of relax and ask them if they have any personal questions or if there's any part of the curriculum they're having difficulty with. Um, and every class, I had some kind of formative assessment. So in the Zoom, um, feature, there's a thing called where you can only uh, comment to the host. So sometimes I would end the lesson by saying that here's the question of the day. You have to type the answer and once they get it correct, they get to exit the Zoom meeting. So I did some kind of formative assessment every time. And we also did summative assessment, like the ones that I was talking about, the long-term animal research report or the habitat diorama. So we've moved on from giving that specific letter or number grades on this uh, assessment to more like the writing written comments. So like what uh, Lina said, uh, uh, the, on the online learning uh, provide opportunities for uh, formative assessment. So in which uh, students can uh, provide their responses uh, uh, and that they, they, can, they can subject that the kids get uh, assessed in a formative way. So number of tools provide for students to post and share and look at each other's lessons. So I think uh, online methods, you can, you can have uh, a number of ways to do online assessment for, in, in a formative way, just like in a classroom, but maybe different affordances. So, uh, and kids, kids are excited when they see each other's answers uh, on the screen. Uh, so, uh, we can provide uh, projects for students and they can provide the rubrics, the criteria for them to self-assess. Uh, so there are still opportunities online for formative assessment. Uh, the major exams at the end of certain grades in school, I think the current uh, thinking is the students go back to school and uh, they might still have to take these high stakes exams. The curriculum has not changed. Uh, the methods, uh, blended learning, online learning, and now we're going back to going, going back to school, uh, school-based learning. So all these will, will be part of what they will experience as they still uh, prepare for these examinations. Yeah. So another question that's come up frequently in the episodes that I'd like you to reflect on is. What, what's going to happen when the pandemic recedes? And what's going to happen when we go back to business as usual? So will the schools just regress as if this never happened? Or do you think that there might be innovations that happen during this special period in, in how parents are approaching this, in how students are approaching this, how teachers and school leaders are approaching this? that might persist afterwards and, and be a kind of a, a move at least a little bit towards a different model. Yeah, so what the current situation has uh, told us is uh, hmm, the degree of preparedness, preparedness to go fully online is not uniform. So not all students and teachers have 100% uh, readiness to go online. Uh, but this crisis has told us that we need to prepare them mentally, uh, pedagogically to, to go fully online, uh, to adapt beyond this uh, school closure. So from that perspective, I think that uh, from my perspective uh, of uh, academic lens, I see uh, some kind of blended learning uh, where you have classroom online learning and use each mode for what is good for. So uh, in online learning, you miss a lot of the social interactions. So classroom interactions are good for social interactions with teacher guiding and scaffolding. Uh, for the online learning, it provides students opportunities to, to explore their own interests, to tap on external resources, and to do some kind of peer learning. So I, 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 I foresee, you, you will see more of this, uh, Seamless, seamless, what I call seamless learning, a research team that surfaced in my research, uh, trying to remove the seams of learning between online learning and face-to-face -face learning. So instead of seeing them as separate, learning different kinds of things, 
you see that has interrelated a more holistic kind of learning. So uh, we need to continue to tweak online learning to make it pervasive, adopt, uh, being able to be adopted by teachers to, to get away some of the disadvantages, uh, for example, the lack of social interaction. So, uh, so for me, I see some of the things will become more important in a new normal. So uh, for, for teachers, for teacher education to strengthen the preparation of teachers to be designers of learning so they can design their own online learning uh, to the importance of inculcating uh, digital literacy skills for students, uh, inculcating some kind of self-regulation so that they can study on their own. So, and providing more equity opportunities to technology access. So I think this crisis shows us that uh, these elements are important. We need to be better prepared for the next crisis. Uh, we need to be prepared for the more uncertain future. So uh, imagine these things become more normal, more important than normal. And uh, in terms of technologies, I see uh, maybe more, more, more interest and in, uh, investment and development of uh, use of technology that have a pervasive presence like AR and VR to complement uh, the lack of social interaction in classroom instruction. I would have to agree with Chiki. I think the biggest lesson we learned, we as in parents, leaders and teachers is that we need infrastructure for everyone. And if we don't have that ready, it can cause a big, big gap in our education for our little kids. Um, and in our schools, we've always been talking about using more technology in the classroom, but it, the schedule is always very packed. There's a certain number of minutes we have to teach for each subject. And the, the teachers are most, most often really focused on getting all those done. So educational technology has been always been the last thing to include in our curriculum. But I think through this experience, we learned that if we have the infrastructure and some kind of online curriculum ready, then when we actually have to move on to something like this, like distance learning, then it'll be a lot smoother for us. Ponya, you have thoughts? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so this is a question that's come on the on the YouTube channel. So I wanted to sort of go with that, which is, um, you know, and this sort of, I think, dovetails with the question on assessment as well. And I think that has to do with sort of the kind of feedback that students are getting, uh, you know, as opposed to sort of a letter grade, uh, you know, are there different modalities or approaches for sort of more like formative assessment and things like that being tried out? Um, and either of you again can go first on that, because it seems to us that, you know, and I think that the issue of assessment, like Chris um, said, is crucial because I, I've always said that, you know, um, the problem is not teaching to the test. The problem is the kind of test. You know, if you have a, a good test, it's perfectly fine to teach to it if you, you know, um, but I think the challenge there is, so what kind of assessment modalities are we sort of looking at in this new sort of new world uh, that's emerging? I honestly think we don't have a structure for that yet because we are very used to having some kind of um, summative assessment at school where students take certain kind of tests, which is same for private schools as well. So when we are moving on to online distance learning, there has been a lot of discussions on how we're going to assess the children. But what we have settled down was to just give them a written comment and just to let them know what areas they have to work on. And this was also related to their social emotional uh, well-being because we wanted to focus more on whether students are stressed, if they're able to join the Zoom meetings without any difficulty, whether they have any problems at home, more so than focusing on the academics. So this term, what we agreed on was that we're going to just focus on written comments and just letting the kids know this is all gonna pass, we're all gonna get through this together, more so than saying, this is the end of the semester project or test you have to take. But we would have to have a lot more discussions on what uh, formative or and summative assessment would look like uh, for distance learning in the future. So I, I see it the other way. Uh, 
So uh, we, I see that uh, learning can affect the kind of future assessments we might have and uh, the kind of learning opportunities that's provided now, uh, which is not precedented in uh, earlier times. So we, we give, uh, we, we can have, uh, see a lot of learning activities flourishing in an online space where students can have the flexibility to do a number of projects, to pursue their own interests, to do a presentation on some topic that engages them. So all these skills and competencies, uh, it might be the case that we do not assess them in the current summative examinations, but I think it's impedes to start thinking about, uh, uh, after all, this is the learning, is, you know, this is what matters. Uh, do, do you want to relook at uh, the kind of assessment they have in the end? So I look at it in the other way, it's, uh, it's kind of push impedes from uh, opportunities given now on what students uh, can do online on their own, supervised by parents, or help their peers on their own, or tapping on their own resources. How can it push in the other direction on the kind of, uh, uh, the kind, what kind of responses and feedback do you want to provide to them based on this? Kurt, do you have another question? I'll unmute here. Yeah. So we've gone through a number of things that are happening in this new normal in terms of the learning environments that are being created. Uh, she had talked about conditions and space, and Nina talked about the feedback, and both talked about the assessment issues. And I wonder if at some point we want to bring this all together into, you know, some kind of a thought paper or a blog post on what the conditions are that that are being provided, whether it's homeschooling in Korea, or global education possibilities in in, uh, in well in Singapore or in Korea. Um, but a question popped up on the side here from the audience. And about health in conditions in Singapore and in Korea. And I don't know whether that's a concern for the teachers or the students or both and, and, and the staff. But before I, I have you answer that question, Nina, can you tell me in the last few months, teachers have had a, a wide range of emotions. Have you felt more frustration, more happiness, rage? Um, you know, what kind of emotions have, have you been going through during this uh, have you felt? Um, has it been any different for you? Luckily, I didn't feel any pain. The whole time I was doing distance learning, I was very excited for it because I was one of the teachers at school who always try to promote this online learning or use of technology in the classroom. So when we moved to distance learning, as I said, my students were kind of used to using online programs and websites. So when we transitioned into distance learning, it wasn't very difficult for them. And also I had a lot of parent support. So whenever I, I needed some student to work on something, if I email the parents, uh, keep that communication open, the parent was able to support that home. But I know that that wasn't the case for a lot of homes especially homes in public schools where the parents are both working. So I feel, I always felt very grateful and I always also felt grateful to be back home while teaching the students in the United States. So I think this whole experience has been very um, enlightening for both me and like all the, all the other teachers who are teaching at this moment. That will be the new normal, whether it happens in 50 years or 30 years or 10 years. Right. What you're doing will be normal. We the, the kids will be going to school, not with the kids in the neighborhood, uh, with with kids with other children around the world. Chika, do you want to comment on that at all? What kind of emotions have you have you seen or heard about with teachers in Singapore? Um, yeah, so these these teachers who are supervising uh, the online learning, they themselves uh, have to work at home, so they are parents of their own kids. So that poses a, a challenge in general where <laughs> you have to work at home and you have your kids to supervise and uh, you have to organize the time, the space for them to do the online learning. So in general, that's a stress uh, that we as a society are facing. But I think we, we are coping well. So, so my wife is also a teacher and she has to learn new practices during this period on how to do online learning. So she has not done Zoom before, but she has picked up Zoom and, uh, you know, so... Uh, Provide opportunities to, to our necessity to, to, to build up these skills, which can prepare them well for the future. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. The, do, either, 
Do yes, either one of you want to talk about this, the health issues in, in Singapore or Korea? Have you heard anything, concerns about the health issues and coming and coming back? Are there new tests? Are there going to be things implemented uh, that you know about? So to give you a bit better picture of what education in Korea looks like, the semester starts in March. So for uh, United States students, we've already met each other. We've been in classroom together for many months. But for students in Korea, they've ne never met their teacher in person. They've never met anyone in the classroom before. So I think that was another gap they had because they, it was hard to make that personal connection with them, which is really important in a classroom. So I heard that in March, the government had said they're going to extend a delay teachers going to school for about two weeks and that continued until it became may so now the students are going to school at least once or twice but based on the school size uh it might be the whole class coming together on one day or it might be half the class coming and the uh, teachers told me that the, the the students have some kind of coverage on their desks and they're all separated from each other so the teachers were saying how they're all in the classroom together, but there's no interaction. It's just the teacher saying, this is what we're going to learn today. These are the assignments. And most of the assignments have to be independent work because they were not allowed to interact with each other. So that was, that was their biggest challenge because they're in the classroom together, but they're basically all separated from each other. And one of the biggest difficulty a lot of Korean teachers told me was that the Ministry of Education um, informs them like how many students can go to school or when they can go. And this kept changing. So they could only plan their lessons for that week. But for teachers, it's really important that we plan for weeks in advance because we need to have that flow in what they learn. We need to connect different lessons together. But because every week things were changing, like if we have a new case in this city, then all the schools in the city had to close down for that week. So they kept on changing, like which school is going to open, how many students are going to come. So it was really hard for them to plan. So that was the biggest challenge that I heard from um, the teachers teaching in Korea. So uh, in Singapore, kids were at home for two months in uh, March, uh, in, in March, April, uh, March, April, sorry, in, in, from April, May, yeah, two months. And uh, since the beginning of June this month, uh, there's been some partial easing of the lockdown. So schools will reopen. Uh, the graduating classes, like uh, the graduating classes, grade levels go back to school every week. So we, for the other grade levels, they alternate. So they go back to school for this week and next week it'll be online learning. So that, that's a way of a partial uh, resumption of uh, school. Uh, I think this is uh, all due to, I guess, uh, seeing how the easing work, uh, work out you know, in terms of the health issues, the, the social se distance separation. So not too many students in school at one time. So we're beginning to move towards closing and we've heard a lot of really exciting things. I, I knew that we would. We've got again a chance to celebrate some innovations that are taking place. I'm not as elegant as Kurt, but I did pick out a tie today that combines some of the colors and the flags of the two countries, which is a tradition that we try to commemorate. But that leads to a question that I have and that is in this initiative, we're trying to feature many different countries in the hopes that, that not just other people can learn about what's going on, but other countries can learn about what's going on. And I wonder whether in, in Asia in particular as a region, there's some cross country discussions and innovations going on in, in Singapore and South Korea or, or is it more that every country has its own issues and, and, and isn't really turning very much to a larger regional uh, uh, collaboration? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been working with a uh, Ministry of Education in Korea regarding distance learning. And through this ex uh, experience, I was sharing my personal experience with distance learning in the United States. 
So in one way or another, it was a cross-cultural learning of how we were doing distance learning in the United States and in Korea. And they wanted to incorporate some of the successful things we did into the education system in Korea. So I think um, we can all learn from each other and we can learn, look at all these cases from different countries and kind of combine them together to really create some kind of global education that we can spread around the world. Yeah, so I, I second that. Uh, we can all learn from each other. Uh, Singapore, it works well because we look, you look at the best practices, successes of other countries and adapt it for its own needs. So uh, in terms of sharing, uh, we have, we have uh, these UNESCO entities, some of which are based in Singapore. So uh, they've come up a number of uh, guide, guide, guides and uh, handbooks on how to handle flexible learning during this period of school closures in in Singapore. Actually, if you Google them, you'll find several of these uh, uh, guidelines on how to do online learning, uh, what, how, how to design tasks for online learning. So there's a lot of sharing at that level. Uh, I, I think Chris was in, invited to one of these events earlier on. So, uh, so there's a lot of uh, excitement about uh, producing all these uh, tips, guides for how to do good online learning. I think it's floating around and uh, I think there's resources out there you can share. Uh, as, as this period tides over, we can share a lot of the painful lessons, a lot of the challenges we met, how we cope with them. I think the audience will work well in terms of the, uh, in terms of uh, how can we sustain this uh, in, in, in when, 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 when business resume uh, to usual in schools and how do we cope, right? cope for uncertain times, cope for the, how do we cope with the next crisis so all together, we can tap and collaborate with each other. Yeah. So if I can uh, just jump in with one quick comment. Um, I think one of the most heartening things for me through this sort of global crisis has been how it has brought educators together. Yes. And it's just sort of in some way uh, brought home to all of us sort of the core values and the reasons why we do what we do. Um, and because suddenly it's it's like all of us are facing the same challenge and it's sort of forced us to go back to sort of foundational questions about why are we teaching? What are we teaching? How do we do it so that it's best for our students? Um, and I think I feel that there is this almost this uh, camaraderie across the globe of educators uh, where suddenly we are all speaking the same language irrespective of whatever languages we might speak. You know, So I think that's been, for me personally, been very interesting to just see people on the YouTube channel who jump in from across the world or even in the conversations we've had. It's like how, that we might differ in our context, we might differ in a lot of things, but the sort of the, the intentions and the values that we bring to it are so resonant and so connected with each other. Um, so I think that's a, something that struck me over the past uh, few months. And something that struck me is that this series and this time is revealing a lot of deficit models. Students can't do this and they can't do that. Teachers can't do this and they can't do that. School leaders can't do this and they can't do that. Parents can't do this and they can't do that. Well, yes, they can. They can actually do all of those things. And mm -hmm. we, we disempower them and we put a glass ceiling over them with all of these deficit assumptions that we're making in the traditional model. And I hope we're not going to go back to that. So we're just about out of time. Uh, Kurt, do you want to talk about next week's episode? I certainly do. Uh, I just read up a couple of things here. I'm, that's why I've been looking down at my sheet when the wind's not blowing over my head. A couple of them have flown off the page. I have to find them. Um, but we have Nicole Blanchard, who's the treasurer of ISTE, and she's also a Google innovator, Apple's teacher, Swift playground teacher, uh, PBS learning media innovator, uh, Microsoft educator. You, that's, that's the first of three guests. She was the, she's been the only one sharing a stage with Tim Cook the head of Apple at an Apple keynote who's not been an Apple employee. So that's interesting right there. Um, she's in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So we'll hear about what's happening in the schools in Louisiana, as well as in Los Angeles. We have so Sophia Mendoza, 
who's in charge of the second largest school district in the nation. Um, I think it's 400 schools, uh, 589,000 K-12 students. She's been a next generation leader by eScope and C COSN. Uh, she's most influential people in ed tech and ed tech learning, uh, innovator of the year award, and just the list goes on and on. Um, so that's the two people who are added to the list. We aren't talking about the, the first person we asked to be on the show. He, add, he added two of, his, um, two of the people who he th thinks would um, flesh out next week's theme a little bit, which is ISTE. ISTE is an organization, International Society. Uh, in, Chris is going to have to help me there. International Society for Technology and Education. Yes. So it, it's, I don't know how many members they have, but it's well over 10,000. Do you have any sense of that, Chris? No, but um, we do need to wrap up, so. Okay, so we have Rich Collado with us, who is a former director of the Department of Ed, Ed Tech Division under Obama, and he also worked in the CIA, actually, and is now uh, the president and CEO of ISTE in instructional design for the CIA, not in spying, um, but uh, we have Rich with us as an old friend. So the three of them will share the space with us next week in Silver Lining for Learning. Great, it sounds exciting. I wanna thank Nina, I wanna thank GKIF for sharing their stories and innovations and for getting up very, very early their time to do this. So thank, thank all you of you for much. participating. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you week. for having us. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.